Gilbo, how's it going? Indie wrestling fans, welcome to Indie Handshake. I'm your host, Jesus Cruz, and today I am joined by one of my good friends in wrestling, and there are very, very few good friends in wrestling, but Mr. Tito Aquino, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great, man. How are you? The indie little indie handshake. <laughs> a little indie handshake. Right By the there. way, that that was the whole indie handshake concept was inspired from Donovan Morgan's handshake. <laughs> bro, bro. I, so I got so accustomed to doing the the, the little fish handshake yeah. that after I left wrestling, I was getting made fun of by like everybody <laughs> why are you shaking my hand like a woman blah 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 blah. it's like i'm sorry man it's just habits you know yeah, yeah. um but uh i, I but would yeah, do it, it i would do it to girls too sometimes like, I, like uh, hey and they're like Ugh. yeah right right but uh you know who was uh worse than that than more uh, than donovan was roland oh yeah Roll, roland's handshake was like dude it was like a little <laughs> but hey that's just the way the business was or is you know right probably still is but yes. I, yeah, I appreciate you uh, bringing me on the show. I've been a fan of uh, of your guys' show Thank for you. about six months now. I didn't even know that you guys started this until like six months ago. I was like, hey, this is pretty freaking cool. It's actually, uh, no, uh, we're actually, this oh, it's been a year. year. No, no, for you guys. Right, yeah. but I didn't know about it until oh, like six it, months it, ago. It. I didn't know about it until six months ago. I think I was following your guys' uh, Twitter page before mm. I even knew what Indie Handshake was right, and who right. was behind Indie Handshake. Once right. I found out, I was like, these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, That's cool, I, I though. Just, I just realized it's been a year, like I, like within a couple of days. Holy shit. Time oh, really? Flies. So but, as soon uh, as COVID started, you guys uh, started yeah. the podcast? Yeah, right there. That's and cool, then uh, I started capturing all these old tapes and just putting all these old matches. We just put one out, out with you and, uh, and Joey Harder, which was a, a great match. We'll get into that a little bit later. But I mm. met Tito in, like, what was it, 2004? Or 2000, mm-hmm. 2003, 2004. 2004. Well, she did the uh, open tryout for Crossing Iron. And, uh, you know, we kind of chatted there. And afterwards, we just, you know, he, he got the he got the uh, award, obviously, the, the scholarship. So, and then we just hit it off. We just, you know, we would hang out afterwards, even, even when it wasn't wrestling. So, mm-hmm. um, so let's we used get to go started. To, we, used with... to go to, we used to go to your house, man, in uh, yeah. Fremont. In Fremont. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We used yeah, to go man, out there uh, show. before shows and get drunk. <laughs> yeah yeah it bad influence man i was a young 18 19 year old kid i mean 21 year old kid yeah 21 exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah man it was, uh it's just uh, part of it man you know if you're gonna do ring crew you're, you're probably gonna end up staying out late and oh for sure out of people's couches and yeah, yeah. anyways uh standard question opening it up you know tell us uh what got you into pro wrestling and more importantly how did you discover indie pro wrestling Mm, okay good question so um (laughs) the way i got into pro wrestling i remember i remember i was like nine or ten years old and uh i used to go to this ymca during the summertime just to kill time you know like i used to be very athletic i mean i used to be into sports um so i used to stay active and uh (laughs) i remember this vividly I've never heard of wrestling. I never like seen anything on TV, right? Um, the close to it was uh, UFC, and in the mid '90s, it was just starting out, right? And my dad was like, "No, you're not watching that because that's violent." Blah blah blah. So he banned me from watching UFC. But anyways, I'm at uh, I'm at this YMCA class. I was like 10 years old at this time, and uh, there's like a group of older kids like hovering over the TV, and I'm like, "What are you guys watching?" And uh, I just remember, from what I remember, it was a Sabu barbed wire match, an old ECW match. It was on a VHS tape, obviously, because it was in the mid-90s. Um, and it was Sabu in a barbed wire match. And that, like, just captured my mind. I was like, what the hell is this? Mm-hmm. You know, there's, like, freaking barbed wire around the freaking ring. Guys are bleeding everywhere. They're slamming each other. I'm like, this is freaking cool. <laughs> so I got, I got all into it. And then... Um, what really inspired me to become a professional re- wrestler was um, Bad Blood 97, I believe. It was when Kane came out. I don't remember what year. I think it was 97. But I remember sure, yeah. it, it, it was Shawn Michaels versus Undertaker. And it was when Kane debuted in the Hell in a Cell. It was the first Hell in a Cell match. Mm-hmm. Anyways, that, draw, that drew me in. I was like, oh, my God, this is what I want to do. This is cool. Um, so ever since then, I, I just been a fan of it. Right. And, um, I, I was a huge, I wouldn't call myself a Mark. I was, uh, no, I'm sorry. I wouldn't call myself a smart Mark. 
because I was never, uh, you know, shit talking on uh, on the threads or anything like that. But I was right. very knowledgeable. You know, when I respected the I respected the sport at a young age. And um, I know that <laughs> when I was growing up, my my whole room was just filled with wrestling stuff. You know what I mean? You wouldn't see one little white spot on the wall. It was all <laughs> wrestling. So for me, wrestling was my life as a right. young kid. That's all I ever wanted to do. Ever since I saw that first match, I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, teachers would ask me. I remember one teacher in high school asked me, so what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a professional wrestler. He looked in my eyes and I'll never forget this. And he was one of the reasons that what, what kept me uh, going and wrestling. Every time I was like down when I was training mm -hmm. or I didn't want to go, I would always think of this guy, this old teacher. He told me straight up, you're not going to be a wrestler. You're going to go to college and you're going to go get a real job. I was like, no, man, like I'm going to become a wrestler. Right. Well, <laughs> long story short, um, I was already a wrestler. I think I was like 21. I had to be 21 because I went into the bar. I saw him at the local bar here. And uh, I was like, remember when you told me that um, I would never be a wrestler? Well, right. guess what I'm doing now? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Blah, blah, blah. I knew you were going to make it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever, bro. But anyways, yeah. uh, water under the bridge, whatever. But that little thing motivated me um when i was training you know because he always you're not gonna do it and my mom like my family always supported me even though they didn't like it but they supported me uh, right. but uh but yeah that's how i got into uh wrestling and then how i got into indie wrestling was um <laughs> um i was into obviously i'm a, i was a huge wrestling fan growing up so i was into backyard wrestling mm -hmm. what kid isn't right right, right <laughs> especially right. in the early especially in the late 90s early 2000s man i was there <laughs> <laughs> right we were all there man um so that's why i don't feel bad talking about it now but when i was wrestling i did feel a little bit like oh yeah dude it was a bad one yeah right, right right so it wasn't just me that felt that yeah. um but anyways, um, so we used to do this little backyard wrestling out, uh, back in my hometown in Gustine, um, a bunch of little high schoolers, you know, we would get together. First, we started off at uh, my friend's house. Um, and we're the same age, we're the same, uh, same age group. Uh, but then we found out that there were some, and we're freshmen at this time. What area then is we, this? This is Gustine. So I grew up in San Jose, right? I grew up in San Jose, but when uh, two weeks before my freshman year started, we moved to Gustine, out in the boondocks, out in the middle of nowhere. So here's this little 14-year-old uh, city boy from San Jose going to a freaking town of 5,000 people, and there's more cows than people out here, out there, you know? So um, so anyways, so we had this little backyard thing going on, and then we found out that there were some seniors, we're freshmen, right? And then we found out that there were some seniors in a different, that lived, uh, that had a house in a different town. Uh, it's called Newman. I don't remember if you know Newman yep. or CCW yep. is from. So we go there and we meet these seniors and they start uh, exposing us to indie wrestling. I was like, you know, in the, in the backyard when we're like, we're, we're all talking. Um, and then they start talking to me about like all these indie wrestlers and this and that. I was like, oh shit, I didn't know that there was um, another layer mm -hmm. of wrestling. I always thought it was like WCW, ECW and WWE, WWF at that time. So then they introduced me to indie wrestling and um, they also showed me um uh, i think it was like a pirate box back in the day um where you we would get like channels with wrestling but it was all staticky i just remember like barely seeing like what the hell was going on mm -hmm. but um it was indie wrestling because i remember them being in a gym it wasn't the wwf uh production and all that stuff it was like in a gym so right. it was different but i was intrigued by it because of the moves everything was just the vibe was different you know, so that's how I got sucked in. And then um, I, I learned about APW, obviously, through Beyond the Mat. Mm -hmm. And then when I did my little research with AOL, you know, the A mm -hmm. <laughs> mom, get off the phone. Yeah. I want to <laughs> dial up. Yeah, the dial up. Right. So um, so I, I go online and do my research about APW. And then I find out that they're not too far from where I live, maybe like two hours away. So um, at this time, I wasn't driving. Obviously, I was still a kid, but my dad would take me to APW shows. So that I, I would always I will always thank him for that. Mm -hmm. um, he would take me to these APW shows. And this was around the time where American Dragon was around and he was wrestling this Jason guy. I don't remember some Asian guy. I don't maybe mm -hmm. you remember, but it had to be after Donovan and Mike left. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but anyway, so, um, you know, I did that. 
I went to those wrestling shows in APW and that was it. I, all I knew was APW. Um, I would get like all these, um, these wrestling magazines. And I remember calling the school in North Carolina <laughs> and being hella nervous. Like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm calling. And I think I was like 16 at this time. And I was like, you know, I'm 16, but I'm going to be 18 in two years. You know, what are, what are the steps to becoming a pro wrestler? Because we really didn't know how to get in at that time, right? right the internet right. was kind of new at the time. I was like six years old at that time. So um, so I would call and I would be hella nervous. But anyways, um, now going into my senior, we did all this backyard wrestling throughout my, my high school years. Now going into my senior year, this is where things got a little, um, things were happening, right? Um, I've always, like I said, I've always manifested me being a wrestler. I've always wanted to do that. Well, my senior year uh, comes around. Football just ended in December. So now it's January, right? February. No, in January of 2004, me and my friends go to this wrestling show in Stockton, right? At the arena. I forgot the name of the little arena. It was a, it was a WWE show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember before the show started, there were some uh, people passing out flyers, right? Well, we got a flyer. And uh, we're like, oh, look, it's a wrestling show. And, and then they're in Sacramento, blah, 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 blah. Let's go, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we, we drive out to Sacramento. And we don't know what type of show it is. We just know it's wrestling, right? There's going to be wrestlers there. Let's go check it out. And uh, so we go there. And it's in a warehouse. It's a backyard show. And first person that I meet is Virgil Flynn. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't remember the name of that promotion, but it was a pretty uh, well-known backyard promotion back in the day. First person I meet, dude, was Virgil. And he starts talking to me all like he's cool. You know, like he, just the way he was when I when right. last time I saw him, he was the same exact way. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, we start bullshitting. He starts telling me that he's a wrestler here. He has a match and this and that. And I was like, oh, no way. That's super cool. Like, you know, um, we have our own little backyard deal in, in our little hometown in Gustine. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. And then um, he tells us that he knows someone that's selling a ring in Modesto. Mm -hmm. Right. Check this out. So at this time, we're juniors and seniors in high school. And we've been wrestling the match on mattresses and like homemade ropes like uh, from a. Uh, from uh from the hose <laughs> like we had hoses as ropes <laughs> like oh, it was freaking like oaky it was oaky rig but it was freaking yeah, legit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. anyways we we wanted a real ring so when this dude when uh, uh 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 virgil told us hey i know somebody that has a ring by you guys in modesto uh do you guys want to check it out we're like sure let's go check it out so mm -hmm. me and my a uh, couple of us that were in the backyard we put our money together i think it was like 600 bucks 700 bucks <laughs> for the ring and uh, we go to the storage in Modesto to go check it out. And uh, Virgil told us there's going to be some people there waiting for you guys. So we go there and meet these two guys that we have no idea who they are. Well, they happen to be the Lizard and Lockjaw, some uh, backyard yeah. legends. Yeah. Backyard Blizzard legends. from the, uh, the backyard documentary. Correct. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> 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 anyways hey man i'm not talking shit about the guy he has yeah. a great heart he really does man i don't know i haven't talked to him in almost freaking a decade or something but uh right. but anyways he was there him and lockjaw were there and there were uh you know they were doing the transition with us or whatever for the ring we gave him the money and then they're all like hey guys do you guys um uh, you know you guys are starting your own deal out here in the central valley do you guys want to you know get trained by us Right. And in our eyes, we're in high school, like, oh, my God, these kids are these guys are professionals. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They know what they're talking about. They've gone mm -hmm. through training. They, they're talking about taking us on the road and stuff like that. So, <laughs> you know, we're gullible as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so we go, yeah, man, come over. So they come over. They start training us. <laughs> they start training us the way, you know, whatever they know. But for yeah. us it was like a big deal. But anyways. About two or three <laughs> weeks later, this happened in January, right? We bought the ring in January, February, right? We were probably like three, four weeks into their training, backyard training. Right. Um, and then uh, when, when he tells me, um, when Lizard tells me, hey, man, in March, there's going to be an open tryout in Hayward at a wrestling school mm -hmm. called Pro Wrestling Iron. Michael, uh, Michael Modest and Donovan Morgan run it. I've heard of Michael Modest in the past because obviously be on the mat. Yeah. Donovan Morgan, I wasn't too familiar with him at that time. Um, I was like, yeah, man. I mean, I've heard of the name Michael Modest. I know of him. Um, so it should be good, right? 
he goes, yeah, come with me. I was all like, all right, let's go. Like for me, I saw this as an opportunity because like I said, man, I, this is all I ever dreamed about since I was a right. kid. Like I would literally have dreams. And I remember these dreams vividly, me being in the ring. So anyways, we go to this open tryout. I pay, I think it was like 25 bucks, $50 or something like that. And I'm like, I'm still in high school. Like I'm, it's March of 2004. I graduated in June of 04. So it was like towards the end of my senior year. And um, I saw this as an opportunity. I was like, okay, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. This is going to be mine. And um, I don't care who's in front of me, but I'm going to I'm going to knock them all out one by one. And right. I don't know if you remember me during the workouts, dude, but I, I had do. those, I had those intense eyes. Yeah. Like no one's fucking taking my lunch, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because I didn't have $7,000 to train, to go to wrestling school. So yeah. for me, my other option was going to go to the military because school wasn't for me. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't um, want to go to college. It right. was either become a wrestler or fucking join the military <laughs> like everyone else does. So mm -hmm. for me, I saw like, nah, man, uh -uh. I don't care how big these guys are. I don't care how older they are for me because I, I was 18. I just turned 18. I'm mm -hmm. going to beat them all out. And dude, every single rep, every single suicide, I just kept thinking in my head, nah, this is mine. Nah, -uh. this is my turn. This is mine. Right. And um I don't remember too much about the tryout, to be honest with you. I do. I, yeah. <laughs> I, well, let me let me interrupt you real quick because it goes back about your intensity and, and your, you know, you wanting it. Um, there was a point where, you know, it was towards the end. I, it might have been the end of it. So for the people that don't know that the tryout consisted of workouts, of, uh, I think you guys were lifting weights, mm -hmm. uh, in-ring cardio, promos. I remember you, <laughs> I remember you did a promo as the Pebble. Like that was your name or something like that, like the little rock or something like that. And uh you even changed your voice, like your voice, you made it like hey, my name is uh... <laughs> I, I don't know if I have video of it anywhere, the but anyway. Pebble. <laughs> I think you called yourself the pebble or something. Oh uh, shit. But Maybe. Uh, Maybe. towards the end, Frank Murdoch, as a joke, to see if you know to see who would freak out. He goes, okay, we got one more thing for you guys to do. We're going to take a school boy from right. the top rope. That's right. And Frank got up and did it. Mm -hmm. And then everyone's just frozen. And then you're like, you were the first one. No one even asked you. You went up and you climbed the fucking top ropes. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like we don't do those anymore, you know? Uh, but it was, you know, it, it remind showed me, that remind, Yeah, sorry. Right. Go on. Sorry. Go on. No, it go showed ahead. what? No, it showed what? No, it showed that you wanted it, you know, it showed oh, okay. that you, you, you know, it was the first time you're ever going to even try this move. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Remind me what the, uh, the bump was called. What was, was it uh, called? School boy. School, which one was that? The High one where you, the one where when, you jump straight jump up and you just, back. okay, yeah. okay, okay. So From check the top this out. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Fucking YOLO, man. I wanted that shit. I'm telling yeah. you. Um, so I felt like I was ready for that trial because there was two things. One tough enough helped me out i would record tough enough and i mm -hmm. would bump in my living room on the freaking floor <laughs> you know i would try to mimic them the most uh, as close as i could to what they were doing on tough enough in the early right. 2000 before i started training um because again we we're doing backyard wrestling so i was still kind of like absorbing all of this knowledge as much as i could right. um and then two um the summer before my senior year, my junior year, going into my junior year, um, I went to El Salvador and uh, my my aunt knew that I was a huge wrestling fan. And she goes, hey, I have a compadre or something, uh, a relative, a friend of the a family of a friend that's a wrestler in the Arena de Salvador. And I was oh, wow. like, yeah, I was all like, dude, that would be super cool. If, like, you know, if I could go and check out the arena, she goes, let me right. see if I could talk to him. And then um, she talked to him. And uh, he goes, yeah, just bring him over. So me and my grandma, dude, my grandma's an OG, bro. My grandma, because I went to, with her to El Salvador, she took me to the arena. And it was like a, maybe an hour drive with the, mm -hmm. in the taxi. So you know how that shit is, bro. Mm -hmm. Man, I go there. And this is the first time I've seen a, an actual ring. I go there and I'm like in awe. I'm like, oh, my God, this is freaking beautiful. The arena, just like in Mexico, you know, like it goes down like this and and uh, anyways, I trained there for like five to six hours, dude. No water break. I was just in love. I was like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. I love this. They were showing me the Lucha stuff. They were showing me how to roll, how to bump. Right. 
Um, I even shot with a few of them. They couldn't beat me in amateur wrestling. Um, they were like, man, this kid's good. Like mm -hmm. you've never had training. I was like, no, nah, I've never had like official training. I've always, you know, done my own thing, mm -hmm. but I've always watched stuff anyway. So I felt like when I went to iron and I went to that trial, I was, I was already, I already knew somewhat how to bump. What you were getting into. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but yeah, I remember that, man. I don't, I, I don't remember the other guys, uh, pussy now but <laughs> well, I do it, wasn't really, getting... it wasn't a it wasn't pussy now it was just like everyone froze like oh oh froze oh okay. yeah everyone's like Sorry. who's gonna go next and uh but yeah it, they just did it as a you know oh for a rib. Let, let, let's see yeah exactly yeah. so uh how was the training there was it what you expected or what were some of the shocks going from training backyard or being a fan to training with like a, a, a well when mm -hmm. they were there like a donovan or a mm -hmm, mm -hmm yeah no yeah um honestly i didn't really know what to expect because i went into that tryout not really i mean i did a little bit of research but not too much so i really don't know what type of wrestling um they train like they could have been an american wrestling company you know what i mean the old old school wrestling i, I didn't know mm -hmm. um i didn't know until my first day of training i'm waiting in the parking lots it was like a week or two after i won the tryout I'm waiting in the parking lot and all I see is this big old freaking buff, bald, white dude just getting out of his car. And it was Oliver John. <laughs> and he was in his bulking season. So this dude was freaking jacked. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> and then, um, so this is my very first day. So I'm over here. I'm 18 years old. Yeah. And he's in the ring chain wrestling. I think he was chain wrestling with Joey or something. But I remember him chain wrestling and he, him just manhandling that person. I'm like, oh, fuck, what did I get myself into? Yeah. Like, I remember him doing a, a, a back chop to the back. I was like, oh, that's not that's not a work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, at that point, I kind of knew what to expect. I knew that this wasn't going to be a walk in the park. I knew that, um, you know, I, 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 I made it here for a reason and I'm not going to quit. No matter how tough it gets, this was my opportunity. This was my one and only opportunity. So I just, I took the ball and I ran with it as much as I could. Right, right, right. And how long from when you started training to when you debuted? And tell us how that process was, how the gimmick came about and all that. Um, I, I trained for about nine months. So I started in like mid-March and then I ended and i started i debuted in december and um i really didn't have a gimmick to be honest with you like at iron i don't think anybody really had gimmicks gimmicks everyone was just like fighters right, you know what right. i mean um, i think i developed my care character later on in my career i felt like iron was um, a great place where i learned the fundamentals of professional wrestling right now later on is when i started developing the character and stuff like that but i think at Iron, I was just some generic green, green kid, a green boy, you know. Yeah, trying to be trying to be a Taz. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember you. You had a an idea for like a mask or something. I knew you wanted to wear a mask in the beginning, like a half mask or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, because I remember you asked me to help, like help you like design one or something. But uh, going back to like training at Iron, you know they don't train. Uh, they don't train like work punches too much. It's all, you know, forearms, forearms, you know, they're a little bit stiffer than everyone else. And I've actually talked to people on this podcast. And they brought up that Tito, you know, is pretty stiff. So were you stiff because you wanted to, or because like, that's all you knew, or was that the style that you were trying to uh, um, accomplish? Before we start, I apologize. I have seen a couple of interviews and I felt extremely bad <laughs> when they brought it up. I'm like, dude, I can feel horrible. I didn't mean to do it, to be honest with you. I feel like that, that's, all, that's the way we were trained. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Was to be snug, not stiff. Right, right. <laughs> I remember there was a huge difference. Um, but, um, but I, I didn't mean to do it. I think it was just in the heat of the moment, like, you know, like when you turn on the switch mm -hmm. type of deal. Um, but I, I, I was a byproduct of my environment. Like, you know, I used to get 
fuck, dude. <laughs> I used to get my ass handed to me at training practice. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt I felt like there was a target on my back most of the time because I was the scholarship winner that came in here for free. You right. know what I mean? So let's push yeah. this kid as much as we can until he quits. Right. Um, dude, I I got cauliflower ears from it. Like I have scars from it. Like, but I never quit. Right. Um, I didn't. Like I said, I didn't mean to be stiff. I just that's just the way we were. That's all we knew. Let's to be yeah. snug. You know what I mean? So again, I apologize for those that I accidentally uh, hit a little too hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, but all is good, man. All is good. Yeah, and it was. Uh, and we'll, actually, we'll talk about this a little bit later because I want to know how it was. Uh, learning this style and then going to a different promotion that maybe they don't work that style. So we'll get that into a little bit, but right. going back to processing iron, uh, tell us what were you, some of your favorite matches for the short period of time you were there before it folded. What were uh-huh. some of your favorite opponents and matches from, from PWI? Yeah, man. So I didn't have too many matches. Right. Um, Cause as soon as I debuted, maybe like six or eight months later, it folded. And within those eight months uh, we didn't have too many uh, shows outside of the dojo. We did a lot of dojo shows, but um, one person that really um, comes to my mind is Virgil Flynn. Once again, you know, mm-hmm. the same guy that I met at that backyard show before I even started. And wrestling. I never knew that, that you met him back then. Because we never talked about backyard wrestling back then. It yeah. was a, uh, you don't talk about that shit, right. bro. There are some people that are on TV right now that I was backyard wrestling with back <laughs> then. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was just the, you know. It just it just happened. But uh, but yeah, man, me and Virgil had some really, really great matches for for as young as we were in the business. Mm-hmm. Got uh, uh, rest rest in peace, Virgil. Um, yeah. But yeah, man, I have I have great memories of him in the ring. Yeah. Any more uh, memories from Iron before we move out of Iron? Yes. Um, <laughs> I have one more thing. Uh, so about me being a product of my environment. Um, I remember one time I was training with Sarah. We were working on forearms and um, it's the first time I ever hit a female, like really. So I went a little bit light on her, right? Dude, she grabs me. She goes, David, I am a wrestler, not a female. And she goes, boom, she (laughs) clocks me, bro. (laughs) I see stars. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So ever, ever since then, I've never gone light uh, on a female even even if it was a female i remember i had a match with melissa one time dude her and i freaking went at it but mm. you know i got their consent <laughs> yeah yeah you know? exactly. but anyways that's one yeah that's one story that i'll never yeah. forget and uh wh- how did you feel when uh they announced that iron was was closing from what i remember um i was um i, I felt i felt a little lost to be honest with you because um I, f- I felt like we were getting kicked out of the house at 13 years old. You know what I mean? If you're a 13 year old getting kicked out of the house, not knowing where to go, who to go to, right. you know, um, at that time I had already built a pretty, pretty good relationship with Tom Castro, the ref. And um, he had a friend in APW called the, his name was Johnny LaRocca. Mm-hmm. I believe Johnny called me or Tom called me. One of them two called me and they're like, Hey man, you know, we've seen you work. We know a uh, pro wrestling iron is not um, around anymore. We mm-hmm. want you to come check out our school, APW. Come check, come check out, come check out our, our culture. I was like, all right. all right. So I go and check it out. And um, from what I remember, I remember everybody was cool from the beginning. Um, they received me with open arms. And uh, I felt like at APW is where I grew the most. Right. You know, I was just around just freaking people with a brain for wrestling. And it wasn't just like the physical aspect, because I felt like at Iron, I I learned the physical part of wrestling, Mm -hmm. but not so much the psychology of wrestling. It was at APW that I learned the psychology and how to really work. You know, who were your main trainers at that time at APW? At at APW, uh, for sure, JJ Perez, Oliver John uh mpt helped out he would come down before the shows and we would do training um kafu who else and then melissa would be melissa would would be training here and there when she was in town right did they make you like sign up as a new student or did you get some kind of you know already pro deal or or Mm -hmm. what was the deal with that no they didn't they didn't have me uh they didn't have me pay to be 
to be a new student, um, I, I felt like I had already a, a somewhat of a reputation and, you know, but, uh, but I did have to pay. <laughs> I did have to pay. Uh, I had to pay to wrestle. I had to pay like $50 every fucking month. And that was not like, I wasn't too happy at that, about that at that point. I'm mm. Like, really? I have to pay $50? Was it like gym dues? Was it like gym dues? It was gym dues. But really, mm. it was to pay the freaking, the guys from SoCal. Oh, so they could, yeah, yeah. Because they were doing closed shows then, right? They weren't doing like, or like yeah, you yeah. had to bring in like a can of food or something to get in. Something like that. like that. Yeah, I remember that. I forgot about that. But yeah, something like that. But um, but yeah, I just remember I'm like, but anyways, I, I paid a little bit, which wasn't that big of a deal. Right. But for me, it was like, man, I have to freaking pay to wrestle. That's stupid. But anyways. <laughs> so in, uh, in Pro Wrestling Iron, you're talking about, you know, you had a target in your back because you were the scholarship guy. Did you feel the same way at APW because you were a Pro Wrestling Iron guy? I did. I did. In the beginning, though, in the beginning, I did feel a little off just because I would always hear about, you know, the um, the the horror stories of APW, the APW, PWI, you know, rival and all that. So I didn't know right. because I was just walking into this. So I didn't know what happened behind the scenes. I just heard right. one side of the story. But then when I got to I or when I got to APW, um, they, they 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 welcomed me with open arms basically right um but um i did feel a little bit of tension in the beginning <laughs> especially because uh i had my uh i had my gimmick my gear already and the logo that i had on my gear was japanese well you yeah. know we're american we're american we don't know freaking how to how to read in japanese yeah. but what that logo was it was the iron logo <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So I remember one of the um, guys from the back, not a wrestler, he's, you know, one of the bookers. Uh -huh. was like, hey, man, what, is that, what does that say on your gear? Yeah. Oh, it just says pro wrestling. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was still, I was still, I still had love for Iron. You know right. what I mean? Because they're the ones that opened the door for me. Yeah, so right. I, I still felt like loyal to them, even though like they were, they were gone. They were done. Right. Any uh, memorable matches or opponents from APW or like some favorite moments? Ooh, a lot, man. A would lot. you would I, you say you were at APW mainly more in your career? I think like so. That's the spot you were at. I, I, I believe so. I believe so. Uh -huh. So sorry, good. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, dude, I was thinking about this. I had many, many great memories at APW, many great matches at APW. Um, a lot of great tag team matches, man. I, I uh, teamed up with Dana Lee at one point and we were ground and pound. And dude, that was some intense matches. And then we ended up splitting up, right? And then we ended up uh, feuding together. Oh, I don't have I don't have those matches. I wish I freaking had those, but they didn't let us record um our own matches back then because they were mm -hmm. doing their own little gimmick selling stuff. dvds and stuff Seven, yeah selling dvds and stuff yeah. um but they would charge uh, but yeah. us when i was doing production there they would charge us to see our own shit bro are you like that was another thing i'm like really bro you're not not only are you charging me to wrestle but then you're charging me to freaking watch my own <laughs> matches too i wish i was a little bit older when i was when i was starting because i would have said something for sure Right, you know, right. like that's, that's, dude, you're an independent wrestler. How are you telling me that I can't do that? Yeah. I'm an independent wrestler. How are you telling me I can't do that? You know what I mean? But Hey, whatever. <laughs> All water to the bridge, but, uh, but yeah, man. Dues, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay your dues. Yeah. Right. Come on. That was just a fucking excuse. Pay your dues and pay your DVDs. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, man, I had a lot of great matches. Um, uh, a lot coming to mind. Me and Dana, uh Derek Sanders and I JJ and I I had a match with Sarah Del Rey there one time that was freaking intense because that was cool because she I think she was at Ring of Honor at that time yeah so this was after Iron and she came back to ABW right yeah maybe she for came a to, show or two it was it was for a show um it was her and uh Claudio um a, a Cesaro yeah yeah right it, it was uh, it was him and her they were in Ring of Honor already and then she came to APW but uh right. they put me in a match with her man I wish I fucking had that that at that tape because from what I remember, that oh man, we have the crowd on their feet. But uh, but yeah, it's not on YouTube or anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you have to pay. It's not on YouTube, but it's oh, on another it's on platform. That, that you, yeah, it's on another platform that you got to oh, pay money okay, to okay, watch. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah, really, bro. No wonder you. <laughs> no wonder that platform never took off because you have to pay for it. <laughs> Nobody wants to pay. 
<laughs> Imagine if you, if you had to pay for YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's why, that's why we keep it free at Indie Handshake. Exactly. <laughs> for now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I know during your time at APW is when I started booking you for, for my shows or other shows, uh, which were primarily Lucha Libre, but uh, I do remember you bringing Derek Sanders and, uh, oh God, uh, oh, the Italian guy. Uh, Vince? Vince. I remember you brought them to one of my shows and I had a little heat with APW. So that created a little like, oh, you guys want to work these two shows. Oh, um, shit. But it was like, you didn't know, you know, and they, yeah, okay, yeah. they wanted the booking, you know, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, so you worked a couple of Lucha Libre shows. Uh, tell us your experience, especially the one that I brought you in the, the San Jose Civic Center. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> oh, man, that was the first out the Salvadorian flag in front of hella Mexicans. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome because it was the first time that I wrestled in, like, like a freaking legit arena, you know, not mm -hmm. a garage or a warehouse. It was freaking awesome. It was just the match. The, I think you put me in with some little kid, like a 13-year-old kid. It was you and John John versus this little kid and Golden Lion, yeah. Golden Lion, yeah, Ulysses. Yeah. yeah. Dude, you, you know what's funny? Um, Ulysses' uh, cousin works with us. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Because um, I, I was telling her I was telling her husband about, you know, how I used to wrestle. She goes, oh, my, my, my wife's cousin used to wrestle. I'm like, oh, what was his name? Ulysses. I was like, no yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, small world, man. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, man, that was a cool, that was a cool, uh, the lucha crowd is different because even who cares if they don't care if you, if you botch a match or not, as long as you're ex like, you have energy, you're excited, you're working the crowd, like the crowd's going to pop. Right. But, uh, I just remember that match. <laughs> we called the match in the back, like four or five different times. Mm -hmm. And then at the end or to, uh, right before the match started, they switched something. So everybody was in a panic, like, Oh my God, what do we do now? What do we do? It's like, fuck. <laughs> And there's four of us, not just, yeah. you know, if it's just two, then it's just two brains, you know, yeah. working. But now there's four of us. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> so I just remember it was just a freaking high spot clusterfuck. Just high yeah. spots after high spots after high spots. Really no psychology involved. No. And no. me coming from a structured uh, background, like I needed <laughs> that uh, psychology. But then I learned that, dude, there's really no psychology in wrestling and, and lucha. And lucha. You know, no, there, there is, but it's, 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 it's different, you know, oh, yeah, the psychology yeah, yeah. is different because I talked to a lot of guys and I tell them like, dude, that has no psychology. He's like, no, it is. It, it, mm. it does. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, maybe yeah. It's, it's just different. Right. Right. Well, um, that, yeah, that's what I meant. It's just a, it's but like a you said, the, yeah. But like you said, the Lucha crowds just want to be entertained, man. They're, they're not there like seeing if you can amateur wrestle, if you can, this and that, you know, it's not yeah. a Japanese crowd. They're right, like, right. The madre from start right. To right i heard a chinga de tu madre on me and uh, the match with me and joey <laughs> oh yeah so it was the same yeah. crowd that was uh, uh one of the same people that always went to the san jose shows oh okay yeah. so i, I brought wish... that i brought that whole family to that iron show and it's so funny because yeah everyone's trying to be like all oh, strong style strong style and it's like chinga tu madre. <laughs> right 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 at the yeah. end it was like apollo chinga tu madre <laughs> I wish I was so I wish I was um more uh more molded in the business at that time because then I would have worked the crowd a little bit more, you know. But it was it, back then it was just four on four on four on yeah. yeah, you know, there's no like working the crowd type of deal, at least not at that level at that time for my training. Right. But uh, but yeah, man. Um you yeah, you took me to some lucha shows, man. You you definitely uh, put my name out there with, uh, you know, some big promoters like Rocky. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I know it was difficult to get into those type of shows. Uh, you had to know somebody. And um, and, I, and I always thank you. And that's why, you know, you, even though we haven't talked in fucking almost a decade, right. but um, you've always been like in the back of my mind, like, you know, he's always you've always been a, a good friend of mine. Oh, thank you, brother. I consider you. I consider you a good friend because we know that in pro wrestling, there's right. not a lot of friends there's a lot of acquaintances but not yeah. not a whole lot of friends i was such a good friend that i that i forgot your wedding date and i <laughs> i put down the right date but the wrong month i was like oh shit it's like hey dude where are you getting married again i already got married uh yeah that's all good we all know you're busy man before covid you were doing all the com uh, all the comedy shows and all that 
Um, so it's after APW, you went to PCW up north with uh, Prime Time and probably all over John. And uh, tell us about that experience up there. I think you're the one that took me to PCW for the first time. I did. I oh, wrestled shit. Roquero. I, I wrestled Roquero. Yeah, you were in a three-way with Roquero and uh, Jesse Jimenez. Uh, I maybe I remember yeah. I remember Roquero because I remember it was a three-way. Freaking, I remember he super suplexed me off the top rope yeah. into the ring, and that shit hurt. And my uh, <laughs> the rep of, of the, the 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 rep of that match was actually the guy that married me. Now that you know, we just talked about me getting married, um, AJ uh-huh. Kirsch. Oh, AJ was Kirsch the, uh... was a was a ref. That was the first time I met AJ. Right, right, right. Was at my first uh, PCW show, and, I, and he was my ref. Well, twenty years down the road, he's the guy <laughs> that's freaking marrying me. <laughs> oh shit! So, but uh, yeah, if you guys, if anyone that looking, works, man, right? If anyone's we looking just, for, we just um, had him. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, I saw his interview. Yeah, but uh, like I was saying, if you guys are looking for somebody, uh, what do they call him? A, a ref? Uh, uh, no. Uh, 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 official, I don't official. know. Official, yeah, a rep official. Someone official. Yeah, yeah. If you guys ever need an official, official agent or whatever, <laughs> hit up AJ. <laughs> AJ, if you're Kirsch. getting hits. Hit up AJ Kirsch. There you go. There you go. So how was uh, how was the vibe up there at PCW? And I totally forgot that I did take you up there. <laughs> yeah, man, you took me places, yeah. bro. You took me to some places. You didn't have to either. Um, <laughs> the vibe at PCW. Um, I want to say was um, different from APW. I feel like we had more freedom at a, at a PCW. Um, although APW was a great uh, company, but they were, this is how we're doing it. This is what your character is going to be. You know what I mean? I didn't have much freedom. Right. PCW on the other hand, it was a lot of, it was sometimes a little too much freedom, but Hey, that's what made it fun. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I th- I want to say at PCW is where I started to evolve into the Pitbull gimmick. Mm-hmm. You know, the crowd was hot over there in Oroville. I remember mm-hmm. it was at a skate park, right? Where you took me. It was like a skate park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was still looked good. Like the, the building looked like a little, almost like a little mm-hmm. TV studio. Kind correct, of. correct, correct, correct. Yeah. But, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, man. Um, yeah, PCW uh, did me good. I learned uh, ring psychology from MPT, Oliver mm-hmm. John. Um, you know, I definitely learned, um, how to work the crowd at PCW because that crowd was so easy to work, man. Mm-hmm. It was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Any memorable, ma- any match that sticks out from PCW? <laughs> yeah. Um, quite a few, man. Um, quite a few, uh, Dylan Drake mm-hmm. for sure comes to mind. Him and I had some pretty, pretty intense fights, um brian cage and i had some really good um we had a good little feud going on right uh, who else Chupi. i remember him and i freaking went at it because he's more of a high flyer i i really wasn't so right. i was more of the base guy so he i was just basing him and but yeah man yeah pcw for sure so tell us you know from when you started training uh what were your goals then was it to go to WWE versus your goals later on when you were like in PCW? So my goal um, was always to get to the WWE, especially at that time, because there wasn't um, AEW, like TNA was out there, but it wasn't as big. WCW had just folded. So the only big company that you could really make money was WWE. Mm -hmm. Um, That was always my and all right i always wanted to make it there until um until uh, i started training japanese style Mm -hmm. and then i was like man i don't know if i want to be a wwe wrestler because they don't wrestle the same way these guys are wrestling the way i'm being trained um so from my time at iron and apw i wanted to go to japan and mexico wwe wasn't really on the back of my mind anymore Mm -hmm. you know especially like especially in the mid 2000s, man, where like small guys weren't really, um, weren't, weren't really being used as much as today, you know, like we would, we would, uh, see Eddie Guerrero, Ray Mysterio, but that was about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we didn't. So for me, I was like, dude, WWE is probably not for me because of my height and my size. Mm-hmm. I think I would probably be a better, um, be a better uh, suit in Japan or Mexico. So, right. so it, it, so it did change. And again, like, you know, uh, the five people that you hang out with, more likely you're going to be like them. So 
I was only hanging out with, and I was only watching Japanese wrestling. So of course, that's what I was drawn to. Right. That's what I wanted to do. Right. And what made you ultimately decide like, Hey, you know, the, the wrestling's not for me anymore. I got, I got to hang up the boots. <sighs> the politics, the politics was one of the big things that was, that really uh, put a bad taste in my mouth. Cause I've always been the type that, you know, if I have control of my own destiny, like I'm going to make the most of it. Right. But in wrestling, you really don't have too much control of your own destiny. Like you have to be at the right place at the right time to get that big break. Mm -hmm. And I watched guys that were in the Indies long before I was, and that were still not even close to the WWE or mm -hmm. to that level. Right. So in my head, I'm like, man, like, do I have to do another five to six years of indie wrestling to finally get noticed? Right. But what happens within those five or six years? What, what if I get hurt? You know, like, who's going to, like, I don't have health insurance through mm -hmm. wrestling. So the health insurance part is one thing that, you know, that I started looking into more like, dude, if I get hurt, like, what's going to happen? Or if I get paralyzed? Because I was wrestling a little, um, you know, freaking doing the, 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 the freaking the Japanese suplexes, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like that mm -hmm. is not really good on your neck or your body right. or taking those stiff forearms, you know? Right. I mean, yeah. So that, I think that's what uh, did it for me. And then also um, around the time that I started thinking that all this stuff was in my head. Um, I went to uh, cauliflower alley that year and uh, Pat Patterson uh, had a seminar and he told us straight up, like, look at yourself in the mirror and be honest with you. Would you, would you be able to sell tickets at Madison Square Garden? And if the answer is no, then you need to take a better look at yourself and think about what you want to do because this business is not easy. This business is hard. And I really, and that really hit me. Well, a couple months down the road, um, Masawa passes away in the ring. Mm -hmm. That right there, bro, that did it for me. In 09, I think, 08, 09, um, I was like, dude, no, because I could have been anybody. And because we were tight with, well, not, I was already at APW, but, but because I came from Iron and Iron had a relationship with Noah, I felt like, man, this could have been one of us in the ring. And it could have been because Bison was in that match. Yeah. Could have been Bison. Could have been he Mark. ended up passing shortly after, yeah. Correct, correct. And that's another thing, too. Like, I mean... I respect the industry still, but the death rates at that time in the mid two thousands were getting ridiculous. Like almost every other month, a wrestler was dying because of yeah. a heart attack. Yeah. I remember you texted me when Eddie Guerrero died. It was early in the morning. You texted me. Eddie Guerrero has passed away. I couldn't believe it. I woke up. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like I just saw him not that long ago and now he's yeah. gone. So yeah. I don't want to sound you know, and I remember. Like, I don't, don't want to bring the vibe down, but that that's what no. really that's what know, really got me out, man. And I know Eddie was a big influence in you because you, um, you know, uh, I think you even started using the Amarillo, Texas, like like a uh, uh, birth or not birthplace, but like you know, uh, Amarillo, Amarillo, Texas. Yeah, and then I, re um, I remember you did the frog splash shortly after um, you died at one of my shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. And mm -hmm. then I started doing the the three amigos. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he was a huge influence on me. So that really hurt me. Right. You know what I mean? And um, I just, I just knew that if I stayed in long enough, cause I know how I am, like I'm, I'm an intense person. So I go, it's either all or nothing for me. You know what I mean? So I knew like, if I suck around, well, I'm, I'm fucking doing this. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to quit until I get this job done. But you know, I knew that with, with all of those guys, passing away early i was like man i don't know if, if i if i want to live that life and then the movie the wrestler came out Ooh, that right there i was like okay boom put yeah. put a stamp on it i'm done um just because i would watch all of these old timers that i saw growing up yeah um coming to all to these shows and living the same exact life that mickey rourke portrayed in that movie right that was real to me man that was real shaking all these what year did you uh, retire? Uh, I want to say oh oh nine, summer of oh nine. Okay. Yeah, uh, but uh, but yeah, I remember. I remember like meeting all these uh, luchadors 
and shaking their hands in the back and dude, their thumbs would just be all crooked and stuff. <laughs> like that's a different type of indie handshake, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it. dude. But it was gnarly. But yeah, man. Um, I'm not trying to discourage anybody if they want to become pro wrestlers, you know, but just know what comes with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, for sure. Um, now going just getting into a little bit more fun stuff. Um yes Tell please us, and any uh any favorite road stories that you have you know from you know driving up to yuba city you know going to shows all, all over california uh, <laughs> yes um road stories man we you guys influenced me <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, you guys I, were I, a bad influence on yeah. me man <laughs> i think i tell my wife now i think i'm like i'm 35 now and i'm like very chill i'm i'm like I talk to a lot of people. So when I come home, I just want to like, don't talk to anybody. You know, I, I'm a, I'm an introvert by nature, but, um, but yeah, you guys, you guys uh, exposed me to a lot of things. So, why, so that's what I'm trying to get to now. Like now at my age, like I'm very calm. <laughs> like I don't do anything because I felt like I did all that shit. Like in my, in my, in my youth years, yeah, I'm an old partied. soul now. We partied yeah. a couple of times, but um, there was this one time, <laughs> I had to think back on all the fucking great memories. Uh, there was this one time I was with, uh, it was, um, we're driving, we had shows in Sacramento. And then somehow we were in Chico. But anyway, so Friday night, we leave San Jose. And it was, uh, it was Derek, JJ, I want to say, Nate, Rules, mm -hmm. and somebody else. I can't remember. But anyways, we drove, I drove, I didn't drink. I was not drinking. I was a driver, but, um, they were drinking in the back seat on fucking from San Jose all the way to Sacramento to, until we got to the house, wherever we stayed at, yeah. we got to that house. They were already freaking buzzing and I'm sober as a cucumber inside joke Castro. <laughs> I was sober. And, uh, so anyways, um, we go, we go out clubbing because at this time I'm, I'm already 21. Mm -hmm. Um, so we go out partying or whatever. We get up the next day, go to the gym, hungover, but whatever. That was like the thing. Just fucking take a, take some emergency. You'll be fine. We worked out. Then we go to PCW, right. For the show. Then after the PCW show, we uh, drive to Chico to go meet up with AJ Kirsch and his crew. Cause he lived in Chico at that time. And um, this was Saturday night. We partied all. So we've been partying from like, Thursday to freaking Friday and then Saturday. <laughs> and then we go out Saturday night. We wake up the next morning in Chico and we find out that it's um, 420. <laughs> and we're like, well, shit, dude, we're in Chico. Fucking, why not? We've been partying fucking since Thursday. Why not just stay another day? Because we were supposed to go home Sunday morning. And we're like, what? Well, fuck it. Why not just stay? We're in Chico. And we're, you know, we're in our early 20s. So, you yeah, know, we're in, the, yeah. in that college phase stage. And um, we ended up crashing at um, Derek's buddy's house, but his buddy and his roommates had left for something to go do something. So we had the house to ourselves. We had the apartment to ourselves. Um, we had no beer at that time. So we had to go get beer and uh, we wanted to play beer pong. So um, we go get a case of beer. We walk downstairs, uh, go to a liquor store, grab like two cases of beer go back upstairs. We're like, Oh, where do, where do we find a table? There's no table here. It's a freaking college dorm. Like there's nothing. <laughs> so then Derek's freaking comes up with a bright ass idea to freaking take the door off of the hench, <laughs> put fucking two, two chairs <laughs> and put a fucking tip, put the table on top. So then that's how we played beer pong out on the oh, pad, shit. out on the balcony, man. <laughs> and then P all these, all these students were like getting into their rooms. Like, Oh my God, are you guys new here? Blah, blah, blah. We're like, no, we're just visiting our friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're like, "Oh my god, you guys fit right in." <laughs> we had Derek with us; he was freaking party animal. Um, so, anyways, we we just fucking walked around uh, the campus, just drinking it because it was a party. Everybody was out that day, you know what yeah. I mean? And then um, I remember, the, oh God, <laughs> I remember the fall. So we partied all the way until the night, probably like ten o'clock at night, and we had to go to bed because we had to wake up early to catch a commute to go back to San Jose. Because, you know, us pro wrestlers, like, we have actual jobs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Indeed, wrestlers had jobs. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back Monday morning because some of us had to get to work Monday morning. So we left Chico, like, at 6 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I remember going, leaving Chico, going into this McDonald's because they wanted something to eat. But I was so hungover, bro. 
I walk into McDonald's and the smell just freaking was not sitting with me. <laughs> I go outside. I start yakking. I start puking everywhere. I don't realize <laughs> that I'm fucking right next to the drive through where people are getting their food. <laughs> <laughs> and you're yakking right there. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't care. I was a superstar. Yeah. <laughs> I was a rock star. <laughs> oh, oh, man. But that, that, was, that was one of probably the best um, road stories. Yeah. It, it was a great weekend. We had a lot of great weekends, but that one will always stick in the back of my mind. Yeah. The 420 weekend in Chico, California. <laughs> <laughs> Just puking your brains outside of Mickey D's. Mm. Um, what about a favorite uh, shady promoter? You don't have to say names if you don't want to. Shady promoter story or like the funniest reason for not getting paid. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's plenty of shady promoters out there, man. Uh, you got to watch yourself. But um, I think the the biggest shadiest promoter story and there's a few um was probably in uh, i think the town was called clear lake or clear water lake or something like that it was up north up at north cal it was a bunch of us apw guys we got booked for this show and the guy was supposed to pay us an x amount of money and at that time it was way more than what we were getting right mm -hmm. um well we get there and it's like hell backyardish freaking show i'm like what the fuck did we drive up here for and i remember the drive out it like get off work like at 1 p.m and drive all the way up to clear lake i think that's what the town is called um but anyways the promoter tried to stiff us he was like oh at the end of the show he goes i'm sorry but we don't have money for for you guys like we didn't draw that many people blah 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 and uh we had kafu with us and at this time kafu was like at his peak mm -hmm. you know the dude's six four at that time, he was like two freaking 80, just freaking muscle. And Kafu straight up fucking flipped the fuck out on that promoter <laughs> in the back. The dude literally, like, he was about to shit his pants. If not, he probably did shit his pants. Right. Because right. Kafu was just throwing chairs like, no, 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 no. We didn't fucking drive. Like, it was, it was bad. <laughs> so Kafu had our back that time. Um, but I think that was like the only time we ever got stiffed. I, there was one other time at... Um, at a show um i got i got booked by the by one of the promoters and um i he he comes to the show right and i'm i, I remember him sitting there and then uh, at, after after the show's over I, i'm asking for my pay i'm like hey uh where's my pay he goes oh i already gave it to you to the guy that brought you uh so I'm like oh okay so you know and i'm young at this time so i'm not like, right, 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 right. I really don't. I really couldn't say a whole lot. Right. So then I, so then I asked the promoter. I was like, "Oh yeah, so the so so and so says that you have the money." Mm -hmm. He goes, "Oh yeah, here here it is. It's fucking ten dollars." <laughs> he gave me ten dollars while he was eating a fucking hot dog and soda. It was, was it, soda. Was this a show that I took you to? No, this was not you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna name the promoter, but this wasn't you. But I'm thinking, I'm like, this motherfucker just jacked half of my pay. <laughs> and he probably, with that money, he's fucking eating a hot dog and drinking a soda with my money that I fucking, that, that should have been mine. So, but yeah, man, <laughs> that, that was, that was, that was pretty shady of that promoter to do, to take my money. But hey, I, I from what I, I, I've been watching your interviews and I'm seeing like, that was like a normal thing to oh, do yeah. back in the day. Yeah. You know, so, but I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I was golf. I was naive, you know. Yeah. But anyways, um, yeah. <laughs> How about any um, crazy fan interactions that you've that you've had? Like even like doing lucha libre shows, coming out with the Salvadorian flag could get you a lot of heat. But has there been a time when someone actually wanted to come in and punch you, or or, or you know something funny that that might have happened with a fan? Uh, yeah, there was one time in Santa Maria. It was a uh, it was it was a tag team. It was basically the Hispanics versus um, uh, Border Patrol gimmick. Mm -hmm. It was uh, me, Kafu, and Aaron uh, Ray, mm -hmm. Ray Mysterio, um, hijo de Ray, yeah, el, el, el hijo de Ray, Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this crowd was hot. It was a Hispanic crowd. There's probably like three thousand people at this event, and um, the Rulos cheated, and they pinned me one, two, three. Dude, as soon as I, I got pinned, 
fucking shit was just getting thrown in the ring. Fucking <laughs> bottles, um, chairs, fucking batteries. I remember fucking a battery almost hit me in the face. Oh, shit. I'm like, holy fuck, dude. Like, I'm on your side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there yeah. was one time I... Um, I, I played a gimmick with a mask on and um, I was throwing tortillas to the crowd, which is probably not a, you know, in today's world in 2021, I'll probably get in trouble for that. But back then it wasn't that big of a deal, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I used to get hella heat, but, uh, but yeah, but one funny story. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to name any names on who was at this event or at this place, but um, mm. let's just, uh, let's just call this, this guy that we brought in, let's just name him Hack, right? Okay. So Hack, we uh, we we brought him in for a show in Bakersfield, California. Hack um, was known to be a little bit of a, a, a partier, and um, after the show, he uh, we go out to a bar in Bakersfield called Zingos, I think. And uh, anyways, he. Because we had already booked him in a previous uh, show. He, already, he was already familiar with us and familiar with me because I actually kicked it with Hack um, on, the, on, on the last time he was, he was there. Mm -hmm. But anyways, we, after the show, we go to a bar. We get, we, he's buying us drinks. The bar is buying us drinks, whatever, whatever. We're getting fucking hammered. And uh, it's 2 o'clock. We're going home. We're getting in the car. I'll name one person because this person's not alive anymore. <laughs> it's um, uh, James, the Irish drunken man. You remember him from SoCal? Irish not drunken really. man. So he's a driver. We had him on the show that night. So he's the driver. Hack is up here. And then it's me and another dude. But anyways, so before we got into the car, we're getting into our car. One of, this, one of these rats <laughs> uh, follows us to uh from the show to the bar and then once we're leaving the bar she goes hey where are you guys going <laughs> and then of course hack was like we're going back to my hotel and we're gonna have some more beers you want to come with us <laughs> i like how you didn't want to say the name but you're, you're already doing the oh, I mean, no, well, let's just call him hack <laughs> let's just call him hack that's not his real gimmick name but let's yeah, just call yeah, him hack yeah, yeah. <laughs> people that know who i'm talking about no but anyways yeah. um <laughs> So this chick comes into our, and this is all consent, by the way. This is all consent. So the chick gets in the car with us. And of course, I remember it's James driving, Hack, me, and then the other dude, and then the rat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're driving to the his hotel to go drop them off, to go drop them off. And um, he starts, he turns around, Hack turns around, and he starts flirting with her. And uh, he basically tells her, show me your boobs in a nice polite way <laughs> the chick fucking flashes them while we're in the car and i'm like oh fuck like and she wasn't a good looking girl either like <laughs> and i'm just like oh shit something's about to go down right and then they start making out like all aggressively and shit and he like he's fucking like looking back he's like, from, he, like <laughs> right so like if we get a, if we get in a car accident this motherfucker's flying out the window <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we get to the hotel room. We thought we let them go into his hotel, whatever. We had um, the promoter had us get him beer before the show started. So when he got to the hotel, he already had fucking his beer there. But anyways, we let him do their thing, whatever. They come outside. They're cool. Like they're friendly. We're waiting outside. There's like a group of us. There's like six of us outside. <laughs> and um, we go into his room because he's like, oh, come inside, guys. Everything's cool. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and then, like, we're chilling in there, and then all of a sudden, Hack takes off his pants, and he goes, can you bleep this, or are you going to bleep this? He goes, believe, yeah. okay, he goes, all right, are you going to blow me or what? <laughs> <laughs> and we're all in the room. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then she goes, okay. Oh, shit. Bro, he hops on the bed. She hops on the bed with him. We're all fucking there watching. <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on here? Is this like out of this fucking, this is like fucking like a different parallel universe shit going on right now. Right, right, right. And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they do their thing for, you know, whatever. And uh, he tells one of us, he didn't tell me this. He tells one of us I was in the room. He goes, hey, kid. 
grab my grab my camera and take a picture of this. <laughs> oh damn, he wanted a memento of that. And because because at that because he had a Polaroid camera because remember right. back in the day they would take oh, pictures yeah. and fucking sign it or whatever yeah, yeah so he had a Polaroid camera with them so he was like yo kid take a picture of this so he starts fucking <laughs> so one of us not me starts fucking taking pictures of him in action with this fucking chick <laughs> and I'm you like had to wait the- for it to develop hold on hold on <laughs> do another <laughs> one. <laughs> so anyways I th- I think it got to the point where we're like all right guys we gotta get the fuck out of here because this is getting fucking weird. We let them do their thing, whatever, whatever. The chick comes out. She goes, um, do you guys have any money? Because I need to get back home. Like, oh, fuck. Because at that time, we didn't have Uber. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was yeah, taxi. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. just taxis. And trying to get a taxi at like 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. Like, good luck with that shit. Oh, in Bakersfield. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, I don't know how she got home. I don't remember. I think we might have called a taxi. I don't fucking remember. It was a while ago. <laughs> Um, but anyway, she ended up leaving and, uh, we ended up going back into his hotel room and just started chopping it up and as if nothing ever fucking happened, <laughs> we just started talking wrestling after that. Just I'm giving like, you oh, advice that's... about the business and all this. Yeah. If, if a ring rat ever like comes to you, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we don't, but, have uh, enough, we don't have enough ring rat stories on, on the podcast. That should, yeah, be, because... that should start being one of the questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not in the wrestling business anymore, so I don't care. And yeah, I already told my right. wife, I told my wife ahead of this, like what we're gonna be talking about, because I never told her that story. <laughs> and I was debating, I was debating, should I bring it up? Should I not? But uh yeah, I mean, you know, it's entertainment. As long as I'm not saying any names, we're good. Because I'll yeah. take the blame. I was there. <laughs> right, right, right. Have you ever had any embarrassing moments? at a show or in the ring during a promo, anything like you're like, oh, fuck. <sighs> the only thing that really comes to my mind, I don't, I don't think I ever had embarrassing moments. Of course, you had botches here and there, um, but I don't think those were like embarrassing. I think the most embarrassing one was um, we were wrestling somewhere by the bay. This is for Daniel Pewter's promotion. Um, I was already in APW, um, but he booked us by this boat like it was like a, those army boats i don't know what you call them like those oh, SS. Was, it, was it yeah yeah the horn was it the hornet was it the uss hornet one of those something like that it was like a uss hornet in alameda i from what i remember probably. probably yeah yeah but anyways i just remember we had it our dressing room was up on the boat like at the very end so we had a walk from our locker room through the boat and there's like people <laughs> it wasn't a it wasn't for it wasn't a wrestling show it was just uh, a wrestling show just happened a, a wrestling ring just happened to be at that low at that event that day right, you know right. what i mean so these people weren't really there for wrestling so it was just hella awkward like in my tights like trying to <laughs> i was already like in my gimmick you know what i mean and walking through the fucking boat and people are just staring at me like what the hell yeah. is this fucking guy doing in tights <laughs> you know what i mean right. and then um we go down and wrestle and uh, we do a spot, and uh, I was wrestling um, Vincent and Chris Cole. Chris Cole, mm-hmm. right? Chris. Mm-hmm. I was wrestling Vincent and Chris, and uh, they did a. We did a spot where um, where Vince put his armpit up in the air, and uh, Chris grabbed my face and face pied me into his Hit armpit. Stop. Yeah. I just remember that was the grossest fucking thing I've ever done in wrestling, and people <laughs> were laughing. So it wasn't like a good spot. It was like, ha ha. Because yeah. you know the fans there weren't there to watch wrestling; they're just there to, you know, do their thing. Right, right. So I think that was the most embarrassing um, moment in wrestling. It wasn't really that embarrassing, but it's probably the most embarrassing. Is is that the most out of place story too? Like I just thought about this. Like sometimes shows happen at weird ass places. Right. So you would say like this was probably the weirdest place you've ever wrestled. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like I could do the flea markets. You know the right, carnivals, right. but but I, like that was just not planned well. But whatever. Yeah. So I know you kind of already mentioned about you know um, the reasons you you got out. You know you started seeing all these guys. You know uh, uh, having health issues or, or or you know money issues or whatever. But what what were other things that you find disappointing about the business in general? The biggest thing that I found disappointing was. Um, how they don't take care of their workers, uh, company, uh, uh, like legit companies. They don't have, um, 
they don't have benefit plans. They don't have health insurance. They don't have, you know, pensions, life insurance. They don't have any of that stuff. Um, so that's one thing that, um, you know, I've just uh, made me discouraged. Like, okay, so if I'm doing all of this, like, we're like, I know I'm an independent wrestler, but at mm -hmm. that time, I didn't know what a 1099 was. I didn't know what an independent contractor was. Right. You know what I mean? I don't think I ever, never mind. I'm not going to say something. <laughs> okay. But I was going to say, I've never, I don't think I ever paid my taxes when I wrestled. Oh, for wrestling? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever paid all that. But, uh, but again, I didn't know what a 1099 independent contractor was right. at that time. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest things that really got to me was the, the lack of, uh, of benefits that the workers did not get right okay well then tell us uh what, what are you up to now man what's you know are you i don't think you're ever going to come back as a wrestler but would you like to come back as, a, as in another uh position in wrestling or are you just done with it completely uh, i don't yeah i don't know man like i enjoy watching my friends that I grew up in wrestling. I'm, I, I'm enjoying watching them on TV now. I don't see myself really going back into wrestling, like physically, unless it's like a different role. And I'm not talking about like being in the business. I'm talking about like helping the wrestlers out, you know, with benefits, because what I do now as a profession, I'm in the financial services industry. Right. So I set people up with their pensions. I set people up with their retirements, health insurance. I do all that. Like I didn't, I was never planning on doing this. Right. It just, I just happened to get into the financial industry a couple of years after I got out of wrestling. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, um, I, I see myself helping out the boys and girls, you know, okay. with uh, their benefits. Cool. Uh, anything you want to put over any, uh, where can people contact you if, if they do have questions about that? Um, yeah, you can always contact me um, on Twitter at Tito underscore Aquino um my facebook is uh david aquino uh, david is my uh my government name even though i still go by tito believe it or not uh people still call me tito and i you know i still go by by it um but uh but yeah man if you guys um if, if you guys need any assistance or education on that let me know and i will be more than happy to help you any shout outs you want to give out before we we end this interview um First of all, I would like to give you guys a shout out at Indie Handshake for doing this because um, this is uh, this was something that has been long overdue for the NorCal industry. I mean, the NorCal scene. I feel like right now, um, all the work that these guys put in in the 2000s is starting to flourish. It's starting to blossom. And I think right now is a perfect time to put a spotlight on NorCal and show the world where all of these guys that are in the WWE right now or EAEW came from. Right. You know what I mean? Right. No, thank um, you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. So I would like to thank you guys uh, for this. And um, yeah, man. Any and, and then also, again, I apologize to anybody that I might have been a little <laughs> bit stiff with. I did not mean to do that. It was yeah. probably just in the heat of the moment. Um, but yeah. And, uh, and my wife too, man. Um, she's been, uh, she's been, a, she's the backbone of my family of, 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 of us. So she, right she I didn't, I didn't meet her in wrestling. I met her after like years after wrestling, but, um, but I'm still the same guy. Like I'm, I'm still intense, just in a different arena. No pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Todavía los puedes cachimbar. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> cachimbar. 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 All right, well, thank you a lot, Tito Kino, and thank you for watching Indie Handshake, and I'll see you guys next time.